Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's event at the Berkeley Forum. My name is Lucy Chang, and as the president of this organization, it brings me a lot of excitement to introduce tonight's event, which is Warren Mosler at the Berkeley Forum. First, I'd like to encourage everyone to fill out our attendance form at tinyurl.com backslash Mosler attendance and to submit a question um, for a speaker that our student moderator will ask at tinyurl.com backslash Mosler questions. I'd also like to begin this event with a land acknowledgement. The Berkeley Forum would like to take this time to acknowledge that our events in UC Berkeley's campus sit on the territory of the Ohlone people and that we benefit from the occupation of this land. It is important to us that we recognize this history out of respect for the Muwakma Ohlone who are still present in Berkeley and the Bray area today. For more education, for more native education resources on campus, we encourage you to look into the centers of educational justice and community engagement. I'd also like to give recognition to our student organization partner for this event, Undergraduate Economics Association, and pass things off to Katya Yudina, um, who is the president of UEA. Awesome. Thank you, Lucy. Yeah, thank you to Forum for hosting this wonderful event, and a big thank you to Warren Moser for taking the time to be here today. Um, my name is Katya, and I'm one of the UEA co-presidents. The Undergraduate Economics Association is excited to be a partner in this discussion today. UEA is the oldest and largest organization on campus that is sponsored by the Department of Economics. We strive to serve the community of all interested in the topic of economics and have diverse interests in business and tech as well. We work towards providing career growth opportunities for our members via professional events and skill development workshops, as well as cultivate industry contacts. We also pride ourselves on creating an encouraging environment for students to engage with economics outside of the classroom by hosting numerous academic events, such as professor luncheons and academic salons. We're excited for this event to bring yet another opportunity for fruitful discussion in the field of economics and specifically modern monetary theory. Now I'll pass things off to form event manager, Raisa Khan. Um, thank you, Katya. Um, so Mr. Mosler is an American economic, uh, economist and theorist, um, and he got his bachelor's in economics from the University of Connecticut in 1971. Um, he's one of the leading voices in the field of modern monetary theory right now. Um, he co-founded AVM and Illinois Income Investors. Um, he also developed and sold his own automobile line called Mosler Automotive. Uh, he has also authored The Seven Deadly Innocent Frauds of Economic Policy, in addition to founding the Center for Employment and uh, Full Employment and Price Stability at the University of Missouri, Kansas. Um, additionally, he has ran for several offices, including U.S. President as a delegate to Congress and Lieutenant Governor. Um, and he's also the founder of Mosler's Law that states, uh, there is no financial crisis so deep that a sufficiently large fiscal adjustment cannot deal with it. Um, and with that, I would like to hand it off to Mr. Mosler for his speaker address. Okay, thank you for that introduction. Good to be here. So what I'm going to start with are the contributions that modern monetary theory has made to the uh, what's called the history of thought in economics. The most important one is uh, could be best understood by the word sequence. Every congressman uh, believes, every member of parliament believes that they have to get money first before they can spend it. They have to get money through either taxing or borrowing to be able to spend. If they don't get enough taxing, with taxing and they want to spend more, they have to be able to go out and borrow it somewhere. Otherwise, they're not able to spend. And that uh, is inherent in the uh, uh, mainstream economic models as well. That's th those are uh, the implications of the models. And so what uh, modern monetary theory has done, and it's something that everyone in actual Fed monetary operations, uh, monetary affairs uh, has always known, is point out that, in fact, the dollars to pay taxes, for example, come only from the US government through its agents. All right. And so if the dollars come only from the US government and its agents, that means that the US government has to spend first before taxes can be paid. It has to spend first before government bonds can be purchased. So it reverses the sequence. And once you've reversed the sequence, a lot of things happen. Uh, for example, the idea of um, solvency, 
is no longer applicable once you understand that the source of the dollars is the government itself through its agent, in this case, the Federal Reserve Bank, right? And, um, and we can see this in action and the effect that modern monetary theory has had on policy. If we just look back at what happened uh, to the Obama administration when they were trying to do what was called a stimulus package, you had Paul Ryan talking about the US becoming the next Greece if it ran up the deficit and that we'd be on our knees at the IMF begging for funding. You saw President Obama and uh, Secretary Clinton go to China, who they believed were our bankers to make sure that they would finance our deficit spending. Uh, you had Paul Krugman talking about how the deficit spending was going to cause interest rates to go up. Uh, and you had um, the whole debate was pushing the solvency issue that the US was going to go broke if we tried to spend this much money and if we tried to borrow and what if the markets didn't finance us and that type of thing. And in fact, they cut their stimulus in half and uh, it turned out that it wasn't nearly enough. And we went through a very painful recovery process. Uh, now, if you look at what happened with COVID uh, after eight years of what I'll call the influence of modern monetary theory, uh, 2.2 trillion was authorized and spent and there was no mention of solvency. No one talked about the US becoming Greece. No one talked about borrowing from China or running out of money. No one talked about leaving the debt to our grandchildren. Not by no one, I mean, there were a few isolated congressmen, but it was not part of the debate that decided whether or not this package would happen. Uh, there was some discussion as to whether it might cause inflation, and uh, which is the point modern monetary theory had been making, that solvency is not an issue. It's never an issue. It's never been an issue. Uh, what could be an issue in the case of overspending is inflation. Should that inflation, uh, that is, it's possible for inflation to come from excess demands. So you can see just in the United States in the last several years, I, and I would say, this is evidence that modern monetary theory has won. And I'll declare victory right now and uh, move on to telling you a little bit more about what it is. So number one is the sequence. Uh, number two is that we have uh, shown how taxation, tax liabilities, not the payment of taxes, tax liabilities are the cause of unemployment. Without a um, monetary economy that has course of taxation, there is no unemployment. Unemployment is about people looking for it paid work, not people looking to volunteer or help out the family. And if you don't have the currency, you don't have people looking for work paid in that currency. And the currency is created by the tax liability. The currency is the tax credit that satisfies the tax liability. So uh, taxation, tax liabilities by design create unemployment. That's a contribution from a modern monetary theory. Uh, I also want to point out something a little more recent, which is not, I uh, can't take full credit for it, but the idea that the Federal Reserve has the interest rate thing backwards. Uh, in effect, uh, models all show that when you raise rates, you add to aggregate demand. And if your inflation is coming from aggregate demand, it makes it worse. When you lower rates, it goes the other direction. In addition, uh, if you look at forward pricing, uh, as evidenced in all the commodity futures markets, the uh, Interest rate itself is the difference between spot and forward prices. And inflation, what I would say properly defined academically as the term structure of prices faced by today's agents when they make purchases is actually equal to the Fed's policy rate. So when they're raising rates, they are raising the rate of inflation. They are directly raising the term structure of prices faced by today's agents when they uh, buy and sell for forward delivery. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is back up a little bit and give you a, a little model that I'll fall back on. And it's a true story, it's, it's, it's a nonfiction. Uh, and it's about the Europeans when they went into Africa uh, to um, grow coffee, for example. So, uh, and it was a British and a French and others did very similar thing. So they went into Africa with the idea of growing coffee in this example. And what they wanted to do was to get the uh, population down to the coffee fields to grow coffee. And the population had no interest in that. They were busy living their lives. It was a non-monetary society. They could offer to pay them. They didn't know what they were talking about. Uh, they were taking care of the children, preparing food and hunting and uh, harvesting and whatever else they did to uh, sustain life. 
right? So what the British did, and the French did as well, is they put a tax on their huts, their houses. They had grass huts back then. It was called a hut tax. And they demanded that they pay a certain number of crown. It was just a made up script uh, per month or else they were gonna get their, their, their house burned down. And the military was there to make sure that if they didn't pay the tax, their house would be burned down. Okay, this immediately monetized the economy. It immediately created unemployment. The tax liability was the hut tax. Suddenly people are unemployed. They're looking for paid work and they can't find any because all that's been announced is there's a tax. And if you don't pay it with these crown, whatever they are, the tax credit uh, that only the British have and can issue, then you're gonna get your house burned down. So it's a coercive taxation that creates unemployment. And then the British would announce, okay, if you show up at the coffee fields, we'll pay one script a day or one crown a day or whatever they wanted to pay. People would show up at the coffee field, they would do the work, they would get paid, they'd go home and they could pay their tax and their house would not get burned down. Right? Now, this is, demonstrates the sequence that I talked about earlier. First comes the tax liability, not the tax payment. Well, let me go back one more. First, we have a government that wants to provision itself. We have the British that wants its coffee, it wants labor on the coffee plantation. We have uh, the US government that wants to uh, provision itself with a military, with a legal system, with uh, public health workers, et cetera. It wants to transfer real resources from the private sector to public domain. So how does it do it? It uses a monetary system. So number one, it issues a tax liability, which creates unemployment, people looking for paid work in that currency. At that point, the British could then hire the people looking for the paid work. They'd come down to the plantation and it would pay them. So first there's a tax liability, which creates unemployment. Then those people get hired, then they get paid, notice the sequence, and then the tax itself gets paid. Okay, so the the British or government, they are not collecting the tax to be able to spend. They're collecting the tax after the dollars have already been spent, after the script has already been spent. Okay, so uh, the additional thing and contribution from important uh, technical contribution, fundamental contribution from modern monetary theory is that the currency itself is a simple public monopoly. The government has the tax credits, the dollars that we need to satisfy our tax liabilities. And so it's a case of a monopoly, just like you learned in uh, economics in micro 101. Okay, they have the tax credits and we need them and they are price setters. They dictate terms of exchange. They tell us what we have to do to get them. There's no market for this when you have a monopoly. It's a case of a single supplier. And, and they have also created the demand. They've created a tax liability with severe penalties if you don't pay. The IRS is one of the most brutal enforcement agencies we have. All right, and so what does that tell us? Because the currency is a public monopoly, the government's price setter, that tells us the source of the price level. Where, where does the price level come from? What is it a function of? And it's a function of prices paid by government when it spends. And it's always through its agents, of course. Congressmen don't go out and spend the money. They'll direct the Treasury and the Federal Reserve and other agents, the military, to spend it for them. But it's the government through its agents, um, spending is the source of the price level. We need the dollars. They tell us what we have to do to get them. We need the dollars. If you serve in the army, you get 50,000 a year. If you sell us a jet plane, we'll give you $3 billion, whatever it is. They're telling us what we have to do to get their currency. Now, of course, we have congressmen who think that they have to get our money to be able to spend it. It's the opposite. We need the government's money to be able to pay the tax. Uh, and so that's additional uh, contribution of modern monetary theory. So uh, if we go back to um, Africa now, we can see these, um, this, this thing, this in action, All right? So people needed these, the crown to be able to pay the tax. The government would tell them what they had to do to get it. They'd say, we pay one crown a day. Now uh, market forces, when they went back home, would determine you know, how many crown it would take to buy a quart of berries from somebody who was out picking berries because people would weigh the cost of each one. Do I wanna go out, and, you know, how many berries can I pick in a day? Well, maybe I can pick 10 quarts. Okay, well, I can either go out and pick 10 berries or I can go work for a day in the coffee plantations. Well, people were indifferent at some ratio. Let's say that was the ratio. 
Uh, and so some people would rather work in a coffee plantation and earn more than they needed to pay the tax. So they could then buy berries instead of uh, picking berries and selling them. And so you get, uh, what do they call it? A double coincidence of wants or something like that. But that's how markets uh, determine relative value and sort out prices. Okay, so if the government paid one crown a day, it might be determined through market forces that one crown is worth 10 quarts of berries. Right? Well, what would happen if the government, if the British paid two crown a day for the same work? All right, well, now you only have to work half a day to earn a crown because you can earn two in a whole day. Now the markets would translate that into uh, only five quarts of berries. Okay, so by raising the price the government paid, it's redefining its currency downward and it just caused 100% inflation because now instead of where one crown used to buy 10 quarts of berries, now it only buys five quarts. All right, it's just a little example of how it worked. Now, in the last part I'm going to talk about is the public debt. Okay, so invariably, the people working on these plantations in Africa would earn more than they needed to pay the tax. If they needed 10 crown a month to pay the tax in their house, they, the total population might earn 15 crown, 12 crown, or more than enough. They certainly couldn't earn less because then someone would get their house burned down. But they showed up for work. They would um, want to earn a few extras to save them, to have them in their pocket. And maybe if they got sick or to uh, maybe their parents wanted to take them home as souvenirs. But there, there are all kinds of reasons uh, that you would do that. Maybe there were merchants who wanted cash in their cash registers. And so the only place to get them is at the plantation. And so the demand would be equal to the need to pay taxes and the desire to save, to accumulate crown. So at the end of the year, the total tax was a thousand and people had come to earn 1200 because they wanted 200 sitting as uh, savings, cash, um, financial equity in their economy, then that would be the public debt. The government, the British would have um, spent 1200, 1000 get, uh, used to pay taxes and the rest are not used to pay taxes and they remain outstanding as savings in the economy. And that is the public debt. They, the British spent more than they collected. They spent 1200 and they only collected 1000, right? So the public debt in the United States is the same thing, excuse me. It's the dollars spent by the government that have not yet been used to pay taxes and they remain outstanding in the economy. Now, back then in Africa, they remained outstanding as actual probably paper script in the economy in somebody's pocket or an emergency off, uh, place of business or something like that. Today, they're in bank accounts. And those bank accounts are accounts at the Federal Reserve Bank. And they give them fancy names, but they're still uh, liabilities of the Federal Reserve Bank. And they come in the form of cash, reserves, and treasury securities, securities accounts. So their cash, which is a uh, receipt, which is a tax credit, is a Federal Reserve liability. Their uh, bank deposits, which consists either of re what they call reserves, which are dollar deposits in transaction accounts, reserve accounts. A normal bank would call it a checking account. Fed calls it a reserve account. And they are dollars in deposits called uh, treasury securities, which are time deposits or savings accounts. It's a Federal Reserve Bank. So the, the total public debt is all the dollars spent by the government that haven't yet been used to pay taxes. Because when they spend a dollar, either it gets used to pay taxes or it doesn't. And these dollars that haven't yet been used to pay taxes sit as cash reserves or securities, cash or balances in securities accounts, reserves accounts. Okay, and so the British spent 1,200 and only 1,000 were used to pay taxes. The other 200 were outstanding. Is that a problem? Does that cause the British not to be able to pay people who come down to the plantation? Of course not. Is that some debt that they owe the next generation or something? Of course not. Okay, and so the and it's the same thing now. The public debt is a residual. The dollars spent, they haven't used to pay taxes. They sit in accounts. They have to be in one of those three forms. They are just an entry on the Fed's books. They're, they only have three options for these entries. When uh, treasury securities mature, the Fed just debits your securities account, credits your reserve accounts. In other words, when your savings account comes due, they put the balance in your checking account. And if you want it in your bank statement on a green piece of paper instead of a computer, they'll give you actual cash. But it's all just 
all you get in any case is a bank statement, either on a green piece of paper or a statement for what's in a, a electronic deposit. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is leave it here because uh, to see what kind of questions I've generated and then we'll go in the direction of the questions. But thank you very much. Yes, thank you so much, Mr. Moser. I would like to now invite our student moderator, Mayhul, to the virtual stage. Hi, Mr. Moser. Thank Hello. you for your remarks. And it's a pleasure to have you at the Berkeley Forum today. Thank you. Uh, so before we transition into the moderated portion of this event, I want to remind everyone in the audience that we have a question form pinned in the comment section, and we'll be taking a few of those questions at the end. So for my first question of the afternoon, Mr. Mosler, I'd like to ask about the two primary goals of price stability and full employment within the MMT framework. So to start off, I wanna hone in on that full employment component. How does MMT propose that the government can guarantee a full employment economy that withstands recessions? Okay, so if we look back at the African model, which is what I have, so you can look at it. They had full employment when there wasn't any tax. When the, before the British came, there was no such thing as unemployment. People were employed hunting and gathering. They were employed farming. They were employed tending animals. They were employed taking care of the children. If somebody would invent a labor-saving device, it's not like they'd have unemployed people walking around with nothing to do. You know, Life always has more to do than there is time to do it. And everybody worked. The grandparents would help take care of the children when the parents were out working. So there, there was no such thing as unemployment as we know it. People looking for paid work who can't find it. Okay, it just didn't exist. It, it wasn't applicable to their lifestyle. Okay. That happened after the British imposed this tax. Then there was unemployment. Okay, all of a sudden, these people are looking for paid work to keep their homes from getting burned down for paying the penalty. And so how did the British respond to that? Well, the reason they did it is because they wanted to employ these people to provision the government by having them work and growing coffee. And so they said, all right, anybody who comes down to the coffee plantation can get a job growing coffee and we'll pay one script per day or whatever the wage was. And people came down and earned enough to pay the tax and to net save to the, as much as they wanted to. They didn't have to net save, but if they wanted to, they would, the British would let them work. Why not? They got people coming to work. That's what they wanted. So there was no unemployment. So in the base case uh, for analysis, which is what I just described for any monetary system, dollar, euro, yen, you name it, uh, pound, ruble, okay? There is no unemployment. The government, uh, in the, um, the money story, the government uh, imposes a tax liability because they want to hire people to provision a government. The tax liability creates unemployed looking for paid work. It then hires them, providing the dollars, the yen, whatever, to pay the tax into net save. People then go pay the tax and, and then there is no unemployment. Okay, so unemployment only comes about as we know it when something very, when the government does something different from this base case for analysis. So what the so let's say the total tax was a thousand and people showed up for work and the British said, uh, you know, we're only gonna let enough people work to earn 900 crown. Okay, well now what happens? All right, there's still a big line of people looking for work. The, the tax of a thousand created demand to work, you know, at least a thousand hours and maybe 1200 because people want to save. And the government said, no, we're not going to do that. We're only going to allow you to earn 900. Now, 100 people aren't going to be able to pay their tax or however many it is. And they're going to get their house burned down. Now, the British didn't do that because it's an idiotic thing to do. That wasn't the point of what they were doing. If they wanted to burn their houses down, they could have done that without doing this. Okay, but, but that's how unemployment is created. Unemployment is created when the tax liability creates more unemployed than the government decides to hire. So in the United States today, if we have 5 million unemployed, it's because our tax structure has created, well, maybe the government's, let's say they employ 5 million unemployed. Our tax structure has created 10 million unemployed. Okay, and the government's only hired 5 million of them. And the other 5 million are out there you know, getting their house burned down because they can't find jobs to pay the tax, except out of the goodness of their heart, they get some unemployment compensation so they can scrape by and not get their house burned down. This is a system we've set up, All right. So once you understand that, it's fairly simple on how to 
where the unemployment came from, whose responsibility is it's government, you know, for the amount that they wanted to spend, uh, they overtaxed, period. There's no other logical explanation for it. There's no dispute about this. This is just cold, hard uh, balance sheet. Okay, there's no, uh, nothing complicated about it. And so the government has two choices at, that, uh, choices at those points, just like the British did, if they only had 900. If they didn't want to burn anybody's house down, what would they do? Well, they could hire more people. Maybe they only wanted 900 to grow coffee, so they don't want to do that, but they could. They could hire another 300, so there was enough, because that's how many were waiting in line to earn 1,200 to pay the tax and to save. It's the only reason people work uh, you know, at, at the macro level for the economy. Or they could lower the tax, maybe lower the tax to 700. And then maybe only 900 people would show up and they'd only have to hire 900, right? one or the other. So you, when you have unemployment, you've got to make a fiscal adjustment. You either have to lower the tax or increase your public spending, your public services, uh, just as a point of logic, because that is the source of the unemployment, that you haven't spent enough to cover the need to pay taxes and the desire to net save. Uh, so that's, I think, the answer to the first part of your question. So given that, maybe you want to rephrase the second part? So I think the second part of my question sort of transitions us into how exactly you would measure full employment in the U.S. economy. I yeah. know in the past year or so, um, you know, Chairman Powell of the Federal Reserve yeah. has sort of used the goal of achieving full employment as justification for continued monetary stimulus. Right. Uh, while, while critics sort of dispute that full employment as a metric can even really be measured properly. So right. within the MMT framework is, uh, how would you approach measuring full employment? In the could, be, could be simpler. You offer a job, which uh, as a point of, again, logic, but de facto becomes a minimum wage job. Let's say you offer a $15 an hour job to anybody willing and able to work. Okay, and however many people show up, that's what your unemployment was because it's people looking for paid work who can't find it. And I know there's other frictions in there. And that's called the job guarantee. I call it the transition job. I've done that from the beginning. And I think the job guarantee is a little misleading, but it's a transition job because the tax created the unemployed. It was, a, let's grant the government, uh, you know, what, what do you call it? The benefit of the doubt and say it was a mistake. They didn't do that deliberately. They didn't go out and create a tax structure and say, yeah, let's, let's unemploy 10 million people and then only employ 5 million. Ha, ha, ha. Let's say they didn't do that. Okay. It was an honest mistake. Okay. And I'm not going to argue that too hard, but let's just assume it's an honest mistake. All right. Those 5 million people, and let's say we're already fully provisioned in public sector. We have all the high-speed rail we want. We have all the, the public education we want. We ought to have all the public health. We really don't want to hire any more people at this point. We, we want them back in the private sector. So how do you get them back in the private sector? Well, two things. Number one, you would lower taxes so there'd be more aggregate demand. But we've got another problem. These people, because of government policy, have become damaged goods in that capitalism, the private sector as we know it now, doesn't like to hire people who've been unemployed. They just don't. They prefer to hire people with some kind of track record, been working, who at least come in on time, they're clean, they don't get in fights. It's too risky and expensive to do it, just hire people off the street who've been unemployed, especially for any period of time uh, in today's day and age. They just don't do it. And so they wind up, and there were famously ads after the uh, 2008 crash for businesses saying, you know, help wanted, prefer people already working. We don't want unemployed. And that's true. So what we do is we offer a transition job, the job guarantee. Number one, they're employed in the job guarantee. Okay, fine. It's not necessarily useful output, but they're employed. But now they can transition into the private sector because now they have what the private sector is looking for. They have uh, daily employment. They have a track record. They have a supervisor who can put in a good word for them or whatever it takes to move to get a job. And we've had a couple of historic examples of this happening that show this is absolutely the case. The Hefe's program in Argentina in 2001 and India today has 60 or 70 million in the rural poor program, which does exactly that and it does it very successfully. So uh, that's how you measure unemployment. You count bodies in the transition job. If you have too many people in this transition job, it means you need a fiscal adjustment to get them give them more help to get into the private sector, lower taxes or increased public spending. Okay, if it's minimal, one or 2%, whatever you deem as minimal, frictional or whatever, then you're at about the right level. You're at full employment. 
Now, why is full employment so important? The real wealth of any population that's generated is equal to everything that gets produced domestically, which means at full employment, you're producing more real wealth. And if you've got 10% of the people that could be contributing and they're not, that's a real loss. Okay, so think of it as your pile of stuff. So your pile of stuff consists of everything you produce domestically, plus imports, minus exports. Imports make your pile larger, exports make your piles smaller. The difference is real terms of trade. I'm sure we'll talk about that later. But the biggest thing is your domestic output, your pile of stuff. So by having everybody working and producing more, then you're at your maximum wealth as an economy. Any less than that, if you look at our unemployment right now, and you look at the, given today's productivity, the real losses from unemployment today are larger in one year than all the losses from all the wars in the history of the world combined. It's just staggering the lost output from unemployment levels, if you look at participation rates, of at least 10%. At least 10% addition, we'd have 10% more people working, maybe more, if we had you know, a true economy that was geared towards getting the most out of everybody. So pivoting to the, that second component of the MMT framework, that price yeah. stability component. Yeah. Uh, you've spoken before about mod monetary policy, saying that it's yeah. the kid uh, with the steering wheel that is not attached to anything. So right. what role, if any, would the Federal Reserve and central banks, as well as just traditional monetary policy, um, play in reaching stable prices within the MMT framework? Okay, so uh, the best thing they can do to promote price stability is have a permanent zero rate policy, like Japan's had for 30 years, and they've had the most price stability. Now, when I first spoke about this at the Bank of England, to people from the Bank of Japan in 1998, they weren't so sure. 33 years later, the Bank of Japan is saying, well, we still feel the zero rate policy is an, you know, an inflationary bias. We just need a little more time. Okay, well, I, I, it's convinced me <laughs> if it was, it was going to be inflationary, we would have seen 10 years of zero rates and negative rates in, in the European Central Bank, and they have the lowest inflation rate even now after the COVID thing. So to me, my model shows it. I've set up three different currencies that show this. Permanent zero rate policy is the most deflationary thing you can do. If you want inflation, don't go to the Federal Reserve for it. Leave the zero rate. Use it by increasing public services or lowering taxes. You know, Use, use fiscal adjustment because it, it makes no sense to raise rates, period. Because a positive rate policy, when, you, when the Federal Reserve pays interest, what it's doing is paying out money, okay? So the public debt of 30 trillion, uh, almost a third of it is, is excess reserves with the Fed and the rest is treasury bills, notes and bonds. What, what happens is, and it's 120% of GDP or something, what happens is the government, increase. it's an increase in government spending of the worst kind. It's an increase of government spending on interest payments. It increases the public, uh, the, def the deficit, it's pure, demand side, no supply. It's only paid to people who have money in proportion to how much they have. There couldn't be a more regressive approach to try and propping up an economy and creating inflation or whatever you're trying to do. I don't know what they're trying to do. Try and actually reduce inflation. What I'm telling you is the kid in the steering wheel, they got it backwards, right? When you increase rates, you're increasing government spending and you're doing it in the most regressive way possible that it's basic income for people who already have money in proportion to how much money they have. There are a lot of people who support basic income, but I've never run into one of them who thinks it should only be for people who have money in proportion to how much they have. That's exactly what the Fed does, claiming somehow that's a deflationary policy and cools down the economy. It doesn't. It never has. None of the econometrics show it. it it's not. It's just an absurdity that, that you know I've watched four different cycles in my career now, and they do the same thing every time. So uh, I got you a little bit off track. Go ahead and bring me back to your question. I think you, you gave a great answer. And I just want to touch okay. on the reference to Japan. So most oh, economists... let me give you the price stability. Let me give you the price stability thing. University of Missouri, Kansas City. To learn about the monetary system, I uh, suggested the first year they, they wanted students to do uh, community service. So I said, well, do it this way because it'll have educational value require, they wanted 20 hours a semester of community service. So I said, look, put a tax on everybody in a currency. And they called it the buckaroo because the kangaroos are mascots. So they call it the buckaroo. Every, every student has to turn in 20 buckaroos to get their grades. 
right? Well, how do they get buckaroos? Well, if you go to work at the hospital or whatever, the non designated nonprofits, they pay one buckaroo per hour. This was 1996, all right? And that program is still going on today. And if you, and I did the, if you look at the accounting, the school always spends more buckaroos than they collect because students always save a few or the parents take them home or they lose them in the wash, or whatever. The school's been running a deficit forever. They have a permanent zero rate policy. They don't pay interest on the buckaroos. There's no government interest rate on these excess that people earn. It's a permanent zero rate policy, just like Japan or the European Union and the Fed up until recently. Okay, and, uh, and what was the value of the buckaroo? What was the foreign exchange value? Well, I asked back then if somebody, and, and they didn't like this aspect of it, but some students had a lot of money and didn't want to go do community service. And so they would pay other students to go do it. And I said, I don't like it either, but we're demonstrating in the real world so, so students can learn how things work and have a better understanding. And so back then, students would go work for other students for $5, uh, per buckaroo. So they would go to work for $5 an hour in 1996 and feel they were getting well paid and be happy about it. It was voluntary. Okay. And so the, the buckaroo, you could say the exchange rate was uh, $5 per buckaroo, which was one hour's labor, student labor. Last year, it was like $20 or $25. You have to pay a student $25 to go work for you in the hospital. Okay. So what's happened? The value of the buckaroo has been internally stable for 25 years. It's worth one hour of student labor, okay? Translated into dollars, the dollar used to be, $5 used to define an hour of student labor. Today, it's 20 or $25. So the dollar has gone down in value. The buckaroo stayed 100% stable. So that's what I call internally stable, right? And it was done with a permanent zero rate policy, you know, 20% deficit spending, you know, small open economy with no capital controls or anything else. And so they've had and no unemployment. Any student can go anytime they want and work and earn a buckaroo. If you had gotten a buckaroo and saved it, it's gone up from $5 in value to 25. It's beat the S&P 500. It's beat the stock market. Now, I didn't mean it to do that. It just so happened it did. All right. So that's full employment and price stability. It's got the job guarantee. Anybody can earn the thing, right? That's how you get permanent full employment price stability. And any currency can do it. It's a simple model. It doesn't take anybody more than seven years old to understand the thing. So for my last question, before we yeah. take audience questions, just yes. kind of bouncing off of that micro, that buckaroo micro experiment that you proposed yeah. and comparing it to the U.S. economy. Um, yeah. If the U.S. is similar to the university and the yes. buckaroo is similar to dollars, uh, is there also a consideration made for the fact that there's different forms of money that the U.S. can issue, namely treasury securities, central banks, reserves, as well as fiat currency, or are all those different forms of money in the end buckaroos? Okay, so they're all U.S. dollars, but, and they're U.S. dollar tax credits. So you can use the model to understand anything up to the most complex derivative on Wall Street using the buckaroo model. So the students have these extra buckaroos. The, the, the school could offer them accounts called you know, buckaroo treasury securities that paid 3% interest if they wanted to, and students could take their extras and buy those instead. Now, they didn't do that. Like, why would they? Okay, the British didn't do that in Africa. Why would they? Okay, they people had extra crown. They just held them. They didn't give them interest-bearing accounts. It, would that make their currency more valuable? Of course not. They're just paying more out. If students could earn buckaroos with interest, then they wouldn't have to do the uh, work at the... Uh, Nonprofits and the school wouldn't get any uh, community service work out of it if they paid enough interest. Argentina is paying 50% interest. If they paid 50% interest on the buckaroos, they earn, you know, within a year or so, people would just be able to live off their interest, get to use that to turn in the tax, pay the tax, and get their grades. You wouldn't have to do anything. And so the value of the thing would be worth would be worthless, right? So uh, because it doesn't buy anything, the school would be unable to provision itself. The government would be unable to hire soldiers, unable to hire, you know, public uh, health workers or anything else. It, you know, a legal system. It wouldn't be able to function if it did that. If it gave everybody enough interest payments on treasuries so they didn't have to uh, go to work, then you have nobody going to work, right? The whole system is coercion to get people to work. And so, again, I don't know if I went through enough of your questions about different kinds of money. 
they could have different accounts, which you could put a buckaroo in. They'd still call them buckaroos. They'd pay interest. They'd be overnight accounts and call it reserves. The school could have said, we're setting up a bank called the UMKC Reserve Bank. You can keep your buckaroos on deposit. We'll have checking and savings accounts. The savings accounts we'll call treasury securities. It doesn't change anything. It's not another kind of money. It's not anything of consequence. It's not anything they would do. The only reason you do that it's just a school thinks they need to borrow those buckaroos to be able to pay the next generation of students. Okay. And that's what our government thinks. It thinks it has to borrow through selling treasury securities to be able to spend. It doesn't realize it spent the money first by crediting accounts. Some of those accounts get debited for tax payments. And with the rest of them, they shift the money from reserve accounts to securities accounts, from checking to savings. They, they, they've got the sequence wrong. When they get the sequence wrong, they get the whole whole thing wrong and we get the worst possible outcomes for our society and that's what we've been suffering through for as long as i can remember so thank you mr moser for answering sure. those questions uh, i'll now be asking questions from the audience mm -hmm. so our first audience member is rebecca and she asks i read in your bio that you worked in the banking industry in the 70s and 80s when financial deregulation was at its peak and the industry was greatly expanding. How did your experience in the financial markets at that time inform your ideas about economic policy? Okay, well, number one, I worked on a money desk at Bankers Trust first, and I was in sales and trading of derivatives, which were called, which were Ginny May Securities, mortgage-backed securities at the time. And so I learned, you know, my own curiosity, whatever, I, I came to understand how the uh, clearing system works, how the Fed works, how the money system works, the debits and credits that go on continuously that cause all these things to happen. So I, I, I um, got knowledge, on, specific knowledge on that from the bottom up. And once you see how it's working, you have a very different understanding. It's like if you watch television and you see people moving across the screen, you might think people are moving across the screen. But when you get very close to it, you realize that they're just lights, dots going on and off and nothing's moving at all, all right? And it's the same thing with money. It looks like money's going from one account to another account, but it's not. There's just information, accounts are being credited, the number gets changed to a higher number, accounts are getting debited, the number gets changed to a lower number, nothing's moving, uh, it all balances as a matter of accounting. It's, it's how accounting is how uh, the accountants keep track of what happened, it doesn't cause anything, it's after the fact record keeping. And so I came to uh, understand, you know, the key aspects of the monetary system and recognize that pretty quickly that uh, the politicians, the senior academic economists all had it wrong, all had it backwards. It didn't take much to understand that. And when I talked to people inside the Fed, they, they also knew that immediately. They say it a little differently than I do the sequence. They say you can't do a reserve drain without a prior reserve ad. And their job is what's called offsetting operating factors, making sure that they uh, do reserve ads when they're needed so they don't lose control of interest rates. And, and it's all the same thing. And so when I speak to them, I don't have to, there's nobody to convince about how it works or doesn't work. We just talk about policy and, and its outcomes. And, uh, and so it's interesting that you've got this whole subculture of, of senior, very senior operations people you know, inside the Fed that uh, fully understand this and always have. And yet it's never filtered through to the political appointees or to the uh, to the academic community. So that, that was my thing in banking. The other thing I realized very quickly is that the entire financial sector is entirely parasitic and it has, doesn't need to exist. It exists only because of institutional structure we put in place because we have these things wrong. And I wrote the seven deadly innocent frauds of, mon of economic policy, which show these innocent frauds that have created this monster uh, uh, financial sector that's been entirely parasitic. And a quick example would be in 1972, when I first started in 1973, we had a little over 200 million people and 2.6 million housing starts. And all we had was a bunch of dumb savings and loans. And I was one of them. I worked in the loan department and you know I came in at nine and left at four and we played golf and I made $140 a week. And uh, we financed 2.6 million homes. You know, and the, we were, I don't know, a small fraction of corporate profits in the, in the economy. A few years ago, you know, during the boom, 
we had like, I don't know, 1.8 million housing starts or something like that. And uh, even now, 1.7 million, they call it an unsustainable bubble when we have 350 million people, okay? And the profits of the financial sector are like 30% of the S&P 500 or some absurd number. Okay, they don't add anything to the functioning of the real economy. They don't finance anything that wasn't financed without all of that. It's purely, um, you know, people digging holes and people filling them in as prescribed by government laws and institutional structures that don't need to exist, that get paid millions and millions of dollars a year each where the senior guys are making billions. And they're adding to this massive income um, issue we have in the U.S., uh, and they're not producing anything of value. They're reducing the uh, ability of the economy to produce real value. So that, that was very apparent early on also. So I'll, uh, uh, I'll ask one more question from Leah before I hand it off to Lucy and we can wrap up by 159. Um, so Leah sort of hones in a little more on this difference between Wall Street and academia's understanding of public finance. What do you think is fundamental to why those senior operations specialists at the central bank understand public finance more like you do versus, you know, academics who become appointed as part of the FOMC. Yeah, I, you know, I've, I've wondered about that myself. I've talked to both sides. Vince Reinhardt, who's now back on Wall Street somewhere, was head of monetary affairs under Greenspan and under Bernanke, worked for both of them for something like 15 years. And he used to help me write my speeches, okay? I mean, he understood what I was doing more than anything. And uh, <laughs> I guess I'm talking a little bit out of school here, but, uh, and he used to say that was their problem. These political appointees didn't understand any of this and they would try to explain some of it and they just wouldn't get through. They had their own ideas that they learned in school and, uh, and that was it. And that was the, most uh, frustrating part of their job is to watch these people make these mistakes, you know, continuously for decades. And the whole dialogue was wrong. And so I, I and I'd ask them, well, do you say anything about it? And they, well, they don't, you know, they're not that type of people. They're not um, there to go out on a limb and say something and do something to undermine their career or whatnot. They're, they're nice people, they're academics and they're brilliant, uh, but they're not, um, rabble rousers, which is what you'd have to be to get out and start making these issues with the people you're working for that have been good to you and respectful and hired you and make recommendations for you and everything else. And so they, they're just not politically active type of people, uh, but they're certainly not, they're not part of some conspiracy theory or anything like that at all. Not, it's the complete opposite. They're very solid, intellectually honest, uh, it's really academic, what you hope to find with an academic. Uh, so I hope I answered your question there. Yeah. Um, so thank you for answering those questions from the audience. Sure. Um, that's all the time we have this afternoon. Okay. Um, Mr. Moser, thank you again for sharing your insights. And I will now pass it back to our president, Lucy, for closing remarks. Okay. Yeah. Let me say I'm at WB Mosler on Twitter. If anybody has any questions, wants to message me. Yes, thank you so much, Michael, and thank you, Mr. Mosler, for those insights. Um, with that, at every event, we like to thank our speakers with a custom-made poster, and tonight is no different. So here's our poster. Um, this was made by one of our communications members, um, Brandon Nunez, and after this event, we will have Raisa get your mailing address, so we'll be able to send it over to you. There's a little bit okay. of wor world and bank in there. Um, okay, yeah, very nice. To Yes. Can you just um, can you send it? Just send me a file if that's okay. Yes, we'll also send you a file. Awesome. Yeah, I don't want any any uh, paper. I'm kind of resource uh, efficient. <laughs> mm, okay. Uh, awesome. And there's a lot of work that goes behind all of our events at the forum. So I'd like to recognize our event manager for the night, Raisa, our poster designer, Brandon, communications lead, Kelsey, technology lead, Charles, and of course our moderator, Mayhul. And our next event is with Kevin Tan, who is the founder and CEO of SnackPass, um, which will be Tuesday, April 3rd at 6 p.m. in Chow N100 on UC Berkeley's campus. And thank you everybody for coming to this event. If you have any feedback for us, please feel free to use our feedback forum um, with the
penny url and our qr code for more events please like us on facebook to stay updated um, on what we're doing and also feel free to visit our website and with that i'd like to say i hope everyone has a lovely evening i'd like to thank mr mosley one more time oh actually really quickly if you'd like to help support us please um venmo us at the berkeley forum um to help us put on more events as these are free to the public and um yeah thank you everybody for coming out and for such a great event mr mosler and with that i'd like to give but i'd like to wish everyone a great night or great evening great day okay thank you